523, chapters 11 and 12 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Book talk starts at 444. Welcome to Craplet. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 523. Oh, Gilbert. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am almost done with the infernal t-shirt quilts. <laughs> Next week I will have pictures for you. But for now, I just have Tales of Woe. No, actually, it's turned out really well. Stained glass style with black sashing or letting. Uh, much better for me, I think, than just trying to sew t-shirt material to t-shirt material. I did invest in a walking foot finally, and thank you everyone on the Thursday night call who said, dear God woman, what are you thinking? Of course you need a walking foot. So that's helped quite a lot. For those of you who are uninitiated in the world of walking feet, you have the feed dogs, those little treads that move, they kind of bounce up and backwards. So they pull along, push along the fabric from the bottom as you sew. And then you have the foot that comes down on top of those feet dogs that presses the top fabric down together into a fabric sandwich. This is fine most of the time if fabrics are smooth and not stretchy. However, if you have stretchy fabric involved, something's going to give. Either the, the feed dogs are going to pull faster than the top fabric can keep up or vice versa and things get weird and wrinkly. A walking foot actually provides you with basically feed dogs on the top that match what's going on on the bottom. Um, it's really kind of fun to watch the, the walking foot do its thing. It's a little bit like a Sesame Street style robot. It's fun. Hours, hours of fun one can have looking at a walking foot, she said, realizing that makes it sound quite pathetic, <laughs> how slow things seem to be going. And yet, I run out of time every day working on the quilt. It will have taken dozens, plural, of hours for each one of these quilts by the time I'm done, but mostly that's because of my, my ignorance of the process and, and my liberal use of a seam ripper <laughs> to rejigger several things as I as I learned on the way. So that's almost done. And why is that almost done? That's almost done because thing one, if you've been listening for a long time, you need to sit down. Tomorrow, Saturday, June 14th, 2020, thing one turns 20. I know I'm sitting down too. It's just shocking. That little punk was five when I started this podcast. So Holy cow. It's been a while, huh? So, now that we've all recovered from that shock, not much else is going on this week. Show notes contain all of the fabulous links and bits and bobs that people brought to the Craftlet chats on Tuesday and Thursday. Always good to see everybody. And congratulations to our Kiwi listeners for being. COVID free in New Zealand. Well done, you. Aside from that, not much else is new. Not that much happening. Not that big a surprise. However, lots is happening in the land of Gilbert and Helen. So, when last we left off, Gilbert kind of made it clear to the vicar that he was a bit irked with the vicar and the vicar's tood. Attitudes will not improve any this week. Drama 
ensues. We will have almost an Emily Bronte style passion melodrama today. However, I urge you to withhold judgment from both Gilbert and Helen. Let it wash over you if you are prone to not liking melodrama slash not liking Emily Bronte slash not liking Wuthering Heights. I urge you to, to you the best of your ability, refrain from eye rolling and just kind of take it at face value. It is very possible that this is less melodrama and actual real drama. I will leave it to you to make a judgment at the end of the book. But but for now, go with the benefit of the doubt. Let it roll. See what you think. There's nothing massively difficult in the chapters today beyond beyond the emotional toll it could take. And with that, I'm turning you over to Eden Ballantyne reading us chapters 11 and 12 of The Tenant of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte. The Tenant of Wildfell Hall, Chapter 11, The Vicar Again. You must suppose about three weeks passed over. Mrs. Graham and I were now established friends, or brother and sister, as we rather chose to consider ourselves. She called me Gilbert by my express desire, and I called her Helen, for I had seen that name written in her books. I seldom attempted to see her above twice a week, and still made our meetings appear the result of accident as often as I could for I found it necessary to be extremely careful, and although I behaved with such exceeding propriety that she never had occasion to reprove me once, yet I could not perceive that she was at times unhappy and dissatisfied with herself or her position, and truly I myself was not quite content with the latter. This assumption of brotherly nonchalance was very hard to sustain, and I often felt myself a most confounded hypocrite with it all. I saw too, or rather I felt, that in spite of herself, I was not indifferent to her, as the novel heroes modestly express it, and while I thankfully enjoyed my present good fortune, I could not fail to wish and hope for something better in future. But, of course, I kept such dreams entirely to myself. "'Where are you going, Gilbert?' said Rose, one evening, shortly after tea, when I'd been busy with the farm all day. "'To take a walk,' was the reply. "'Do you always brush your hat so carefully, and do your hair so nicely, "'and put on such smart new gloves when you take a walk?' "'Not always. You're going to Wildfell Hall, aren't you?' "'What makes you think so?' "'Because you look as if you were. But I wish you wouldn't go so often.' "'Nonsense, child. I don't go once in six weeks. What do you mean?' "'Well, but if I were you, I wouldn't have so much to do with Mrs Graham.' Why, Rose, are you too giving in to those prevailing opinions? No, returned she, hesitatingly. But I've heard so much about her lately, both at the Wilsons and the vicarage, and besides, Mamma says if she were a proper person, she would not be living there by herself, and don't you remember last winter, Gilbert? "'All that about the false name to the picture, and how she explained it, "'saying she had friends or acquaintances from whom she wished her present residence to be concealed, "'and that she was afraid of their tracing her out, "'and then how suddenly she started up and left the room when that person came, "'whom she took good care not to let us catch a glimpse of, "'and who Arthur, with such an air of mystery, told us it was his mamma's friend. "'Yes, Rose, I remember it all.' and I can forgive your uncharitable conclusions, for perhaps, if I did not know her myself, I should put all these things together and believe the same as you do, but thank God I know her, and I should be unworthy the name of a man if I could believe anything that was said against her, unless I heard it from her own lips. I should as soon believe such things of you, Rose. Oh, Gilbert! Well, do you think I could believe anything of the kind? Whatever the Wilsons and Mill was dared to whisper. I should hope not indeed. And why not? Because I know you well. And I know her just as well. Oh no, you know nothing of her former life. And last year, at this time, you did not know that such a person existed. No matter. There is such a thing as looking through a person's eyes into the heart. 
and learning more of the height and breadth and depth of another's soul in one hour than it might take you a lifetime to discover if he or she were not disposed to reveal it, or if you had not the sense to understand it. Then are you going to see her this evening? To be sure I am. But what will Mamma say, Gilbert? Mamma needn't know. But she must know sometime, if you go on. Go on? There is no going on in the matter. Mrs Graham and I are two friends, and will be, and no man breathing shall hinder it, or has a right to interfere between us. But if you knew how they talk, you would be more careful. For her sake, as well as your own, Jane Wilson thinks your visits to the old hall but another proof of her depravity. Confound Jane Wilson! And Eliza Millwood is quite grieved about you. I hope she is. But I wouldn't if I were you. Wouldn't what? How do they know that I go there? There's nothing hid from them. They spy everything out. Oh, I never thought of this. And so they dare to turn my friendship into food for further scandal against her. That proves the falsehood of their other lies. At all events, if any proof were wanting, mind you contradict them, Rose, whenever you can. But they don't speak openly to me about such things. It is only by hints and innuendos, and by what I hear others say, that I knew what they think. Well then, I won't go today, as it's getting latish. But, oh, Jews take their cursed and venom tongues, I muttered, in the bitterness of my soul. And just at that moment, the vicar entered the room. We had been too much absorbed in our conversation to observe his knock. After his customary, cheerful and fatherly greeting of Rose who was a rather favourite with the old gentleman, he turned somewhat sternly to me. "'Well, sir,' said he, "'you're quite a stranger. It is, let me see,' he continued, slowly as he deposited his ponderous bulk in the armchair that Rose officiously brought forward for him. "'It is just six weeks by my reckoning since you darkened my door.' He spoke it with emphasis and struck his stick on the floor. "'Is it, sir?' said I. "'Ah, it is so,' he added, an infirmatory nod, and continued to gaze upon me with a kind of irritating solemnity, holding his substantial stick between his knees, with his hands clasped upon its head. "'I have been busy,' I said, for an apology was evidently demanded. "'Busy!' repeated he, derisively. "'Yes, you know, I've been getting in my hay, and now the harvest is beginning. Humph!' Just then, my mother came in and created a diversion in my favour by her loquacious and animated welcome of the reverend guest. She regretted deeply that he had not come a little earlier, in time for tea, but offered to have some immediately prepared, if he would do her the favour to partake of it. "'Not any for me, I thank you,' replied he. "'I shall be home in a few minutes.' "'Oh, but do stay and take a little. It'll be ready in five minutes.' but he rejected the offer with a majestic wave of the hand. "'I'll tell you what I'll take, Mrs Markham,' said he. "'I'll take a glass of your excellent ale.' "'With pleasure,' cried my mother, proceeding with altricity to pull the bell and order the favoured beverage. "'I thought,' continued he, "'I'd like to look upon you as I passed and taste your home-brewed ale. "'I've been to call on Mrs Graham.' "'Have you indeed?' he nodded gravely, and added with an awful emphasis, "'I thought it incumbent on me to do so.' "'Really?' ejaculated my mother. "'Why so, Mr Millward?' asked I. He looked at me with some severity and turned again to my mother, repeatedly. "'I thought it incumbent upon me!' and struck his stick on the floor again. My mother sat opposite, an awestruck but admiring auditor. "'Mrs. Graham,' said I, he continued, shaking his head as he spoke, "'these are terrible reports!' "'What, sir?' said she, affecting to be ignorant of my meaning. "'It is my duty as your pastor,' said I, "'to tell you both everything that I myself see reprehensible in your conduct, "'and all I have reason to suspect, and what others tell me concerning you.' "'So I told her.' "'You did, sir,' cried I, starting from my seat, 
and striking my fist on the table, he merely glanced towards me and continued addressing his hostess. It was a painful duty, Mrs. Markham, but I told her. And how did she take it? asked my mother. Hardened, I fear hardened, he replied, with a despondent shake of his head. And at the same time, there was a strong display of unchastened, misdirected passions. She turned white in the face and drew her breath through her teeth in a savage sort of way. But she offered no extenuation or defence, and with a kind of shameless calmness, shocking indeed to witness in one so young, as good as told me that my remonstration was unavailing, and my pastoral advice quite thrown away upon her. Nay, that my very presence was displeasing while I spoke such things, and I withdrew at length, too plainly saying that nothing could be done, and sadly grieved to find her case so hopeless. But I am fully determined, Mrs. Markham, that my daughter shall not consent with her. Do you adopt the same resolution with regard to yours? As for your sons, as for you, young man, he continued, sternly turning to me. As for me, sir, I began, but checked by some impediment in my utterance, and finding that my whole frame trembled with fury. I said no more, but took the wiser part of snatching up my hat and bolting from the room, slamming the door behind me with a bang that shook the house to its foundations and made my mother scream and gave a momentary relief to the excited feeling. The next minute saw me hurrying with rapid strides in the direction of Wildfell Hall. To what intent or purpose I could scarcely tell, but I must be moving somewhere, and no other goal would do. I must see her too and speak to her. That was certain. But what to say? Or how to act? I had no definite idea. Such stormy thoughts, so many different resolutions crowded in upon me, that my mind was little better than a chaos of conflicted passions. Chapter 12. A Tete-a-Tete -tete and a Discovery. In little more than twenty minutes the journey was accomplished. I paused at the gate to wipe my streaming forehead and recover my breath and some degree of composure. Already the rapid walking had somewhat mitigated my excitement, and with a firm and steady tread I paced the garden walk. In passing the inhabited wing of the building, I caught sight of Mrs Graham through the open window, slowly pacing up and down her lonely room. She seemed agitated and even dismayed at my arrival as if she thought that I, too, was coming to accuse her. I had entered her presence, intending to console with her upon the wickedness of the world, and to help her to abuse the vicar and his vile informants. But now I felt positively ashamed to mention the subject, and determined not to refer to it unless she led the way. "'I am come at an unreasonable hour,' said I, assuming a cheerfulness I did not feel, in order to reassure her. "'But I won't stay many minutes.' She smiled upon me. Faintly, it is true, but most kindly. I had almost said thankfully, as her apprehensions were removed. How dismal you are, Helen! Why have you no fire? I said, looking round on the gloomy apartment. It is summer yet, she replied. But we always have a fire in the evenings, if we can bear it. And you especially require one in this cold house and dreary room. <laughs> you should have come a little sooner and I would have had one lighted for you. But it's not worth while now. You won't stay many minutes, you say, and Arthur is gone to bed. But I have a fancy for a fire, nevertheless. W will you order one, if I ring? Why, Gilbert, you don't look cold, said she, smiling, regarding my face, which no doubt seemed warm enough. No, replied I, but I want to see you comfortable before I go. Me? <laughs> comfortable? repeated she with a bitter laugh, as if there was something amusingly absurd in the idea. It suits me better as it is, she added, in a tone of mournful resignation. But determined to have my own way, I pulled the bell. Now there, Helen, I said, as the approaching steps of Rachel were heard in answer to the summons. There was nothing for it but to turn round and desire the maid to light the fire. 
I owe Rachel a grudge to this day for the look she cast upon me ere she departed on her mission. The sour, suspicious, inquisitorial look that plainly demanded, What are you here for, I wonder? Her mistress did not fail to notice it, and a shade of uneasiness darkened her brow. You must not stay long, Gilbert, said she, when the door was closed upon us. I'm not going to, said I, somewhat testily, though without a grain of anger in my heart against anyone but the meddling old woman. But Helen, have something to say before I go. What is it? No, not, not now. I, I don't know yet precisely what it is, or how to say it, replied I, with more truth than wisdom. And then, fearing lest she should turn me out of the house, I began talking about indifferent matters in order to gain time. Meanwhile, Rachel came in to kindle the fire, which was soon effected by thrusting a red-hot poker between the bars of the grate, where the fuel was already disposed for ignition. She honoured me with another of her hard, inhospitable looks in departing. But little moved thereby, I went on talking, and setting a chair for Mrs. Graham on one side of the hearth, and one for myself on the other, I ventured to sit down, though half suspecting she would rather see me go. In a little while, we both relapsed into silence, and continued for several minutes gazing abstractly into the fires. She intent upon her own sad thoughts, and I reflecting how delightful it would be to be seated thus beside her with no other presence to restrain our intercourse, not even that of Arthur, our mutual friend, without whom we had never met before. If only I could venture to speak my mind, and despaired in my full heart, of the feelings that had so long oppressed it, and which it now struggled to retain, with an effort that it seemed impossible to continue much longer, and revolving the pros and cons for opening my heart to her there and then, and imploring a return of affection, the permission to regard her henceforth as my own, and the right and the power to defend her from the calumnies of malicious tongues. On the one hand, I felt a new-born confidence in my power of persuasion, a strong conviction that my own fervour of spirit would grant me eloquence, that my very determination, the absolute necessity for succeeding, that I felt must win me what I sought, while on the other, I feared to lose the ground I had already gained with so much toil and skill, and destroy all future hopes by one rash effort, when time and patience might have won success. It was like setting my life upon the cast of a die, and yet I was ready to resolve upon the attempt. At any rate, I would entreat the explanation she had half promised to give me before. I would demand the reason of this hateful barrier, this mysterious impediment to my happiness, and, as I trusted to her own. But while I considered in what manner I should best frame my request, my companion wakened from her reverie with a scarcely audible sigh, and looking towards the window, where the blood-red harvest moon, just rising over one of the grim, fantastic evergreens, was shining in upon us, said, Gilbert, it is getting late. I see, said I. You want me to go, I suppose. I think you ought. If my kind neighbours get to know of this visit, as no doubt they will, they will not turn it much to my advantage. It was with what the vicar would doubtlessly have called a savage sort of smile that she said this. "'Let them turn it as they will,' said I. "'What are their tongues to you or me? As long as we are satisfied with ourselves and each other, let them go to the juice with their vile constructions and their lying inventions.' This outburst brought a flush of colour to her face. "'You have heard, then, what they say of me. I heard some detestable falsehood, but none but fools would credit them for a moment, Helen.' "'so don't let them trouble you.' "'I did not think Mr. Mulwood a fool, "'and he believes it all. "'But however little you may value "'the opinions of those about you, "'however little you may esteem them as individuals, "'it is not pleasant to be looked upon "'as a liar and a hypocrite, "'to be thought to practice what you abhor, "'and to encourage the vice you would discountenance, "'to find your good intentions frustrated.' and your hands crippled by your supposed unworthiness, and to bring disgrace on the principles you profess. True, and if I, by my thoughtlessness and selfish disregard to appearance, have at all assisted to expose you to these evils, let me entreat you, not only to pardon me, 
but to enable me to make reparations, authorise me to clear your name from every imprudation, give me the right to identify your honour with my own, and to defend your reputation as more precious than my life. Are you here enough to unite yourself to one whom you know to be suspected and despised by all around you, and identify your interests and your honour with hers? Think, it is a serious thing. I shall be proud to do it, Helen. Most happy, delighted, beyond expression, and if that be all the obstacle to our union, it is demolished. And you must, you shall be mine. And starting from my seat, in a frenzy of ardour, I seized her hand, and would have pressed it to my lips. But she suddenly scorted away, exclaiming in the bitterness of intense affliction, No, no, it is not all. What is it then? You promised I should know some time, and... You shall know some time, but not now. My head aches terribly, said she, pressing her hand to her forehead, and I must have some repose, and surely I have had misery enough today, she added, almost wildly. But it could not harm you to tell it, I persisted. It would ease your mind, and I should then know how to comfort you. She shook her head despondently. If you knew all, you too, would blame me, perhaps even more than I deserve. Oh, I have cruelly wronged you, she added in a low murmur, as if she mused aloud. You, Helen, impossible. Yes, not willingly, for I did not know the strength and depth of your attachment. I thought, at least I endeavoured to think your regard for me was so as cold, as fraternal, as you professed it to be. Or as yours or as mine, ought to have been, of such a light and selfish, superficial nature that, there, indeed you wronged me. I know I did, and sometimes I suspected it then, but I thought upon the whole, there could be no great harm in leaving your fancies and your hopes to dream themselves to nothing, or flutter away to some more fitting object, while your friendly sympathies remained with me, but if I had known the depth of your regard, the generous, disinterested affection you seem to feel. Seem, Helen. That you feel, then, or would have acted differently. How? You could not have given me less encouragement, or treated me with a greater severity than you did. And if you think you have wronged me by giving me your friendship, and occasionally admitting me to the enjoyment of your company and conversation, then all hopes of closer intimacy were vain, as indeed you have always gave me to understand. If you think you have wronged me by this, you are mistaken, for such favours in themselves alone are not only delightful to my heart, but purifying, exalting, ennobling to my soul, and I would rather have your friendship than the love of any other woman in the world. Little comforted by this, she clasped her hand upon her knee, and glancing upwards, seemed in silent anguish to implore divine assistance. Then turning to me, she calmly said, Tomorrow, if you meet me on the moor about midday, I will tell you all you seek to know, and perhaps you will see the necessity of discontinuing our intimacy, if indeed you do not willingly resign me as one no longer worthy of regard. I can safely answer no to that. You cannot have such grave confessions to make, you must be trying my faith, Helen. No, 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 she earnestly repeated. I wish it was so, thank heaven, she added. I have no great crime to confess, but I have more than you will like to hear, or perhaps can readily excuse, and more than I can tell you now, so let me entreat you to leave me. I will, but answer me this one question first. Do you love me? I will not answer it. Then I will conclude that you do, and so good night. She turned from me, to hide the emotion she could not quite control, but I took her hand and fervently kissed it. Gilbert, do leave me, she cried, in a tone of such thrilling anguish that I felt it would be cruel to disobey. But I gave one look back before I closed the door, and I saw her leaning forward on the table, with her hands pressed against her eyes, sobbing convulsively, yet I withdrew in silence. I felt that to obtrude my consolations on her then 
would only serve to aggravate her suffering. To tell you all the questions and conjectures, the fears and hopes and wild emotions that jostled and chased each other through my mind as I descended the hill would almost fill a volume in itself. But before I was halfway down, a sentiment of strong sympathy for her I had left behind me had displaced all of the feelings and seemed impenetrable to draw me back. I began to think, why am I hurrying so fast in this direction? Can I find comfort or consolation, peace, certainty, contentment, all or anything that I want at home? And can I leave all perturbation, sorrow and anxiety behind me there? And I turned round to look at the old hall. There was little beside the chimney visible above the contracted horizon. I walked back to get a better view of it. When it rose in sight, I stood still a moment to look, and then continued moving towards the gloomy object of attraction. Something called me nearer, nearer still, and why not pray? Might I not find more benefit in the contemplation of that venerable pile with the full moon in the cloudless heaven shining so calmly above it? With that warm yellow lustre, particular to an August night, and the mistress of my soul within, than in returning to my home, where all comparatively was light, and life and cheerfulness, and therefore inimical to me in my present frame of mind, and the more so that its inmates were more or less imbued with that detestable belief, the very thought of which made my blood boil in my veins, and how could I endure to hear it openly declared, or cautiously insinuated, which was worse? I had the trouble enough already, with some babbling friend that would keep whispering in my ear, it may be true, till I shouted aloud, it is false, I defy you to make me suppose it. I could see the red firelight dimly gleaming from her parlour window. I went up to the garden wall, and stood leaning over it, with my eyes fixed upon the lattice, wondering what she was doing, thinking, or suffering now, and wishing I could speak to her but one word, or even catch one glimpse of her before I went. I had not thus looked, and wished, and wondered long, before I vaulted over the barrier, unable to resist the temptation of taking one glance through the window, just to see if she were more composed than when we parted, and if I found her still in deep distress, perhaps I might venture to attempt a word of comfort, to utter one of the many things I should have said before, instead of aggravating her suffering by my stupid impetuosity. I looked. Her chair was vacant. So was the room. But at that moment someone opened the outer door, and a voice, her voice, said, Come out. I want to see the moon, and breathe the evening air. They will do me good, if anything will. Here, then, was she and Rachel coming to take a walk in the garden. I wished myself safe back over the wall. I stood, however, in the shadow of a tall holly bush, which, standing between the window and the porch, at present screened me from observation, but did not prevent me from seeing two figures come forth into the moonlight. Mrs. Graham, followed by another. Not Rachel, but a young man, slender and rather tall. Oh, heavens, how my temples throbbed! Intense anxiety darkened my sight, but I thought, yes, and the voice confirmed it. It was Mr. Lawrence. You should not let it worry you so much, Helen, said he. I will be more cautious in future, and in time. I did not hear the rest of the sentence, for he walked close beside her and spoke so gently that I could not catch the words. My heart was splitting with hatred, but I listened intently for her reply. I heard it plainly enough. But I must leave this place, Frederick, she said. I can never be happy here, <laughs> nor anywhere else indeed, she added, with a mirthless laugh, but I cannot rest here. But where will you find a better place? replied he, so secluded, so near me, if you think anything of that. Yes, interrupted she, it is all I could wish, if they could only have left me alone. But wherever you go, Helen, there will always be the same source of annoyance. I cannot consent to lose you. I must go with you, or come to you, and there are meddling fools elsewhere as well as here. While thus conversing, they had sauntered slowly past me down the walk, and I heard no more of their discourse. But I saw him put his arm around her waist, while she lovingly rested her hand on his shoulder. And then, a tremendous darkness obscured my sight. My heart sickened, and my head burned like fire. 
I half rushed, half staggered from the spot where horror had kept me rooted, and leaped or tumbled over the wall, I hardly know which. But I know that afterwards, like a passionate child, I dashed myself to the ground and lay there in a paroxysm of anger and despair. How long? I cannot undertake to say, but it must have been a considerable time. For when, having partially relieved myself by a torment of tears, and looked up at the moon shining so calmly and carelessly on, as little influenced by my misery as I was by its peaceful radiance, and earnestly prayed for death or forgetfulness, I had risen, and journeyed homewards, little regarding the way, but carried instinctively by my feet to the door, I found it bolted against me, and everyone in bed, except my mother, who hastened to answer my impatient knocking, and received me with a shower of questions and rebukes. "'Oh, Gilbert, how could you do so? Where have you been? Do come in and take your supper. I've got it all ready, though you don't deserve it for keeping me in such a fright. After the strange manner you left the house this evening, Mr Millwood was quiet. Bless the boy, how ill he looks. Oh, gracious, what's the matter?' Nothing, nothing. Give me a candle. But won't you take your supper? No, I want to go to bed, said I, taking a candle and lighting it on the one she held in her hand. Oh, Gilbert, how you tremble, exclaimed my anxious parent. How white you look. Do tell me what it is. Has anything happened? It's nothing, cried I, ready to stamp with vexation because the candle would not light. Then, suppressing my irritation, I added... I've been walking too fast, that's all. Good night. I marched off to bed, regardless of the walking too fast, where have you been? that was called after me from below. My mother followed me to the very door of my room with a questioning and advice concerning my health and my conduct, but I implored her to let me alone till morning, and she withdrew. And at length, I had the satisfaction to hear her close her own door. There was no sleep for me, however, that night, as I thought, and instead of attempting to solicit it, I employed myself in rapidly pacing the chamber, having first removed my boots, lest my mother should hear me. But the boards creaked, and she was watchful. I had not walked above a quarter of an hour before she was at the door again. Gilbert, why are you not in bed? You said you wanted to go. Confound it, I'm going, said I. But why are you so long about it? You must have something on your mind. For heaven's sake, let me alone and get yourself to bed. Can it be that Mrs. Graham has distressed you so? No, no, I tell you it's nothing. I wish to goodness it mayn't, murmured she with a sigh, as she returned to her own apartment while I threw myself on the bed, feeling most undutifully disaffected towards her for having deprived me of what seemed the only shadow of consolation that reminded me and chained me to the wretched couch of thorns. Never did I endure so long, so miserable a night as that, and yet it was not wholly sleepless. Towards morning my distracted thoughts began to lose all prehensions of coherency, and shaped themselves into confused and feverish dreams, and at length were followed by intervals of unconscious slumber. But then the dawn of bitter recollection that succeeded, the waking to find life a blank, and worse than a blank, teeming with torment and misery, not a mere barren wilderness, but full of thorns and briars, to find myself deceived, duped, hopeless, my affections trampled upon, my angel, not an angel, and my friend, a fiend incarnate. It was worse than if I had not slept at all. It was a dull, gloomy morning. The weather had changed like my prospects, and the rain was pattering against my window. I rose, nevertheless, and went out, not to look after the farm, though that would serve as my excuse, but to cool my brain, and regain, if possible, a sufficient degree of composure to meet the family at the morning meal, without exciting inconvenient remarks. If I got a wetting, that, in conjunction with a pretended over-exertion before breakfast, might excuse my sudden loss of appetite, and if a cold ensured, the severer the better. It would help to account for the sullen mood and moping melancholy likely to cloud my brow for long enough. So what have we learned today? We have learned that 
It is not okay for a woman to live by herself on her own recognizance, even with a servant. We have learned that Rose is very protective of Gilbert. As as much as she is willing to engage in, and God bless her for it, snarking at her brother when he's being jerky and a clunk, she cares and she's concerned. And of course, she is going to be much more aware of gossip and the dangerous toll that gossip can take on someone's ability to live within a society that is judgy and that can ostracize people and make it very difficult for them to make a living in the world. So she's, she's going to be much more sensitive to that, and that makes sense. We know that Reverend Millward is still just annoying. We also have this moment of either a mistake by Anne Bronte or Gilbert's telling us something. He says about three weeks past since he and Mrs. Graham decided to call each other by their first names. So established friends is what he termed it. When Reverend Millward shows up, he says that it's been about six weeks since Gilbert's visited. And since the, the last thing that happened in the previous chapter was a visit, either Millward misses Gilbert way more than he lets on, and it feels like a longer time, since he's seen Gilbert, or Gilbert feels that time has gone so quickly that it's only been three weeks since the last chapter ended. It's impossible to know which. It's also impossible to know if that's a mistake on Anne Bronte's part, but it does time out with time passing more quickly for Gilbert because he's enjoying himself, time passing slower for Reverend Millward because he's not. So that's a, it's an interesting timing problem, and one that we don't find very often, where it works out, depending on your interpretation, one of three ways, which is kind of cool. Again, we have an opportunity to recognize the fact that Gilbert is writing this in the future, looking back on his past, because he says he owes Rachel a grudge to this day. So we know that Rachel is still a known person in his later life, and apparently that he is still in touch with her somehow. And we, we know that Gilbert is very emotional. He's not Heathcliff, but he's way seriously not Mr. Darcy either. He's like the anti-Darcy. He really feels all the feels very strongly. And I don't remember coming across another male protagonist who feels this much. Rochester at certain moments definitely has his moments. Gilbert seems to feel all the feels all the time. Helen is clearly in a state. Something serious is going on. She's been friendly with Gilbert. She's, she's had her moments of not, not so much standoffishness, but restraint up until this point. And then it was like the wall came down and things were great. And now she's, she's breaking it off. And then the thing with Mr. Lawrence. And now we have no idea what's going on. People have already said that young Arthur looks like Mr. Lawrence. Whether it's true or not, we don't know. Gilbert says no. Everybody else seems to say yes. So yikes. Mr. Lawrence puts his arm around her waist and she puts her head on his shoulder. Holy cow. All sorts of stuff is going on. And yet in the middle of it, you do have Helen saying, meet me on the moor, someplace really private where nobody's going to see them. Meet me on the moor tomorrow and I will tell you everything. So there is an everything to be told, whether it's that she's, I don't know, secretly married to Mr. Lawrence or what. We're going to find out next week. But there's, there is clearly something going on. So, suspense. Before I let you go, I've got two voicemail messages for you. The first is from Joyce, who has updates on mask making. And the second is from Anita, who has a movie and a book rec for you. 
Here we go. Hello, Heather and Craftlit listeners. I just wanted to follow up on the recording that you posted from Tara. Uh, um, it's about the masks. There was some mention of adding T-shirt material to the inside of the mask just to give it, I guess, more strength and a little bit more filtering. Uh, I also heard online or saw online that the filters, vacuum cleaner filters or on the vacuum cleaner bags have the, are the same quality as the filter on an N95 mask. So you can actually cut up a vacuum cleaner bag and put the filter in the center of your, um, your mask and have a mask that will give you the protection of an N95 mask. So I thought it was a, a good thing to pass along. And by the way, it was really fun to listen to Tara. She has a great voice. And thank you, Heather, for all you do. See you on Thursday. Bye-bye. Hi, Heather. So this is Anita, Wellnet Life on Ravelry. I have called, uh, commented before, been a long-time listener to your podcast. I'm really enjoying the new book. I had uh, let a couple of podcast episodes pass me by and finally took the time the last couple of days to get caught up. Uh, so I am... I think you probably will have released one today, the day that I'm I'm recording, but I'm not too far behind. Uh, the first thing I wanted to mention was that a few episodes ago, I think we were talking about Chapter 5, uh, you mentioned how unusual it was to see a woman who uh, made her living by painting, and that I expected the next words uh, that I would hear on the podcast be to, for you to mention last year's movie, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Um, if you haven't seen it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's set a little bit earlier than uh, this book. It's set in the late 18th century, but it is just, it's in French. Uh, it is stunning. It's engrossing. It is fabulous as a movie. Um but, you know, I'm somebody with a history degree, and so historical things, you know, interest me as well. It is uh, very highly researched from everything I've ever heard about the movie and from interviews with the director. And it just, it's it's centered on a woman who is a professional painter during that time period. And, uh, you know, just even just the process of the painting and, and how she actually does a portrait. Uh, we're so, so fascinating. Um, so highly recommend it. You can see, if you have Hulu, you can see it on Hulu, and I'm sure there's ways to rent it elsewhere as well. Um, but I did want to share a book that I just finally started. I checked this out in March from my local library, but now the library is open to pick up and drop off. I figured I better start actually reading it, and it's really good. It's a classic. There's a reason it's a classic. It is Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, and wow, does it speak to the moment we're in. I haven't, as I said, I've just started reading it, but it is, uh, it's really good, and uh, I would definitely put it out there as something for other people to check out as well. Uh, the other thing was that uh, I just wanted to thank you for for the time that you take and the thoughtfulness you take in expressing um, your analysis of things that are going on, not just what's going on now, but but in the past as well. I know that I, um, <laughs> and so many before me, did my own attempt at doing a podcast a number of years ago. And I feel like one of the myriad reasons why it did not ended up end up being something that I that I felt moved to continue doing was that I think I tried very hard to make a very uncontroversial and acceptable to all and just not um not speak from the heart about the things that I, that that interest me in the world as much as as I probably as I probably could have. But uh that again that was several years ago and you know lately with a lot of the things that have been ha happening recently I felt compelled and moved and really surprisingly 
um, gotten a lot of positive reinforcement for actually uh, speaking up a little bit and talking a little bit about uh, what I know, what I think, and how I see the world. And I just want to thank you for t taking the moments uh, to do that. Um, I particularly was uh, wanted to commend you for volunteering to be a poll worker. It's something that I aspire to do one day. One day I, I uh, went from having a small child to going to full-time work, and life uh, had, not, had not been able to do it yet, but Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. Even though there are things about our current political climate, the pandemic, that make that a somewhat of a scary proposition in some ways, you're an inspiration in so many ways. Um, but anyway, that's uh, just my thoughts on that. And I just wanted to say, Heather, how much I appreciate you. So thank you, Anita, for your kind words. And thank you also for the movie. I had never heard of this. I am so excited. Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Thank you. And The Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler. Octavia Butler is so cool. And if you are now a fan of hers, go check out Kindred. Kindred may have been her first book, but Kindred is also intense, amazing, and very worth reading right now. If you aren't familiar with her, Octavia Butler is one of the few women of color who write science fiction. And boy, does she kick butt. It is, uh, uh, it's, she's just incredible. So yes, yes, yes. Highly recommend. So excited. Links to all of this in the show notes, craftlit.com slash 523. And that's it. I hope you're well, stay well, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>